some of you might be wondering where I've been. Well, I was doing RFD until I started asking too many questions. Questions which would bring forth many more questions and add pieces to the puzzle for future accomplishments within this series. So you could say I've been on the hunt to just begin to understand how every aspect of this game works, even the most obscure. And I've also been playing some piano. In today's episode, some might say AQP Bra will pretty much be hacking his way through the entire world of Gilinor to complete these quests. But guess what? People like him also exist in the real world. I know, scary, right? Well, don't worry. By using Dashlane, you are able to protect yourself for free from a variety of threats to your online information. Yes, free. Dashlane first provides you top-notch security by notifying you with their dark web monitoring feature. This feature tells you in real time exactly when and where a database leak online occurs. If this isn't enough to make you randy proof in the real world, well you are also able to generate enormous passwords as well as autofill these passwords in a flash for all of your favorite websites. These passwords are all organized for you into one highly encrypted location within the Dashlane software. And Dashlane doesn't only stop at protecting your passwords, but they can also save and autofill all of your personal documents such as credit cards, passports, and IDs. They also provide a VPN within their premium features for if you ever want to go as far as to keep that IP safe with private browsing. And they are our wonderful sponsors for today's episode of Lower the Better, and if this product interests you, then you can try them out for free on your first device by going to dashlane.com forward slash randy. To complete the goal for today's episode, I would have to invest over 160 hours into solely testing these quests, as well as getting the required skills which put me at around 1000 total level. And like I said earlier, I went through these quests extremely slow because I was testing and basically finding new strategies to use in future episodes. So a lot of the time I devoted will actually not even be seen in this episode, but future episodes yet to come. To formulate a way at overcoming the lowest combat barrow's gloves, I would have to look at the lowest XP methods when completing these quests. This meant for all the bosses I would face within these quests, I would do my best at avoiding EXP through combat, and therefore poison, cannon, and recoil most of these bosses. And as well as trying to find the best ways to kill each of these bosses without using too much EXP, I would also have to complete the quest that didn't give any extra combat XP as the actual quest reward. This meant I couldn't do a lot of the quests such as Vampire Slayer, Fight Arena, and many more that awarded both attack, strength, defense, or HP EXP, but weren't required for the quest lineup in order to get RFD done. And after looking through all the quests and figuring out which I could do and which I couldn't in order to avoid as much combat XP as possible, it basically only gave me a lenience of 2-3 quests that I could swap out before hitting the 175 quest point requirement that Recipe for Disaster has. Unfortunately though, even though I avoided most quests with combat XP, a lot of the subquests in RFD actually did require quests to be done, which do reward you with combat XP. Some great examples of this happening was the Monkey Madness subquest requiring Monkey Madness, which required Trina Village and Grand Tree, giving attack XP, Horror from the Deep giving strength XP, the Legend Start quest line, which requires Heroes quest and Dragon Slayer quest, giving strength, defense, attack, and HP EXP, and many, many more past these. Hit points experience was yet another factor in my overall combat level because there were some quests such as Witch's House required for the final boss of RFD, which granted solely HP EXP and a lot of it. As well, even the Sir Amic Vars portion of Recipe for Disaster would give me another large amount of experience and hit points. So there was some prayer EXP inside of these quests as well, meaning I had to maybe overcome Restless Ghost quests, which I thought I was able to skip at first because Nature Spirit, although having a hard requirement in the quest journal of needing Restless Ghost completed, only needed the Ghost Speak amulet, so I was able to finish Nature Spirit without even doing the Restless Ghost quest. But later I found out, whenever going to the Lumberge Guide and trying to start his portion, that the Restless Ghost was a hard requirement, meaning I would have to go back and get 15 prayer anyways and complete Restless Ghost and Priest in Peril both. 
And speaking of prayer, I actually had to minimize my prayer EXP throughout the entire quest list up to 175 quest points. And this was because some quests give per EXP in the actual quest, such as Killing Gas in Nature Spirit, which is required, and Shades of Morton, which gives a lot of quest points that I needed as well whenever burning the shades at the pyre. And one example of this, which I skipped entirely, was Animal Magnetism, which requires Ectophile, which would give you prayer EXP making that Ectophile, because I didn't want to get so close to 16 prayer and possibly ruin that decimal combat level, which would be the lowest in the game. So from here, after all these quest rewards, I would be melee based and I would be sitting at 45 combat. That is before I had to decide what to do about the Darrow portion of the Monkey Madness reward, which also gives combat XP. So later in the video, I'll talk about this a lot more, but I'll get into details on how I went about trying to get around this Darrow reward. And if I do not get around it at all, I'll also have to decide which is the best option of the two to pick in order to lower the decimal on my combat level to the lowest possible digit. So at the very worst, after Darrow's rewards, if I were to accept them later on in this video, I would have to make sure I did not get above 962 HP EXP after doing all of these quests. So it was a little bit of a nail biter, but I did have quite a few bit of XP to spare in case I needed the HP EXP on some of these quest monsters. But before I even got to the point of deciding what to do with the Darrow requirements, I basically went ahead and did 100 quests overall in order to get the 175 quest points, skipping a lot of those large quest point reward quests in order to do the lower quest point rewards and remain the lowest combat level. Now I just showed you the final stats I would have based on whether I would have to take Darrow's training or not. And this meant I would have a lot of range EXP to spare, and therefore I wanted to go about using a cannon for most of the quest bosses to avoid HP EXP and use a lot of that remaining ranged XP. So because I had all this range EXP to spare, I would definitely be using a cannon to kill most of these bosses and quest NPCs. But there were some NPCs and bosses I couldn't kill within these quests that were immune to cannon, or the area itself I couldn't set up a cannon in, therefore I had to rely on recoils and poison damage to get rid of these NPCs. Now NPCs I would be able to utilize a cannon on would be of course quest bosses, but also those smaller NPCs that I would have to kill such as the skeletons and ghosts in Melzar's maze. But later in that same quest, as an example, I wasn't able to even cannon Elvarg because he is immune to cannon fire, therefore I had to poison him, then force move through a stalagmite to pick his head off of his body. Now a lot more NPCs that served as examples of what I couldn't cannon was maybe the Dagonoth Mother from Horror from the Deep Quest, which actually is immune to cannon even in its range phase, so I would focus recoils for this NPC and other NPCs I would use poison on, like the Witch's House experiment. Now a lot of these quests actually required HP EXP to be gained, and I couldn't cannon poison or even recoil some of the NPCs that I had to kill. A great example of this would be Chompy Bird Hunting, and the later Scratch RFD subquest, where I would have to kill a Chompy and a Jubbly only using Ogre Arrows and the Chompy Bows respectively. So if you all didn't know, you can actually bring a cannon down underwater as long as you bring it one piece at a time. But the problem is, even if you were to do this, well, you can't set up the cannon. Therefore, the mudskippers and the crabs, I would have to grab aggro on, hopefully not hit any damage, and then recoil them down for their hides and crab meat respectively. But unfortunately, I found out that, well, if you teleport out with any mudskipper hides on you, they vanish, and therefore I wasted a lot of EXP just teleporting out of this room. So another instance of not being able to use the cannon was on Entrana when having to fight the tree spirit for Lost City. Now there is actually one way to smuggle a cannon onto Entrana, but it takes a lot of time, and I decided definitely not to take this route and to just risk a little bit of HP EXP when killing it with recoils. But of course, I did have a little bit of help killing the zombie in order to get the bronze axe. Chestbra. So by allowing Chestbra to kill the zombie, it did save me some HP EXP, but I would still have to go ahead and do that last damage on the tree spirit. Fortunately though, I didn't even have to get 36 woodcutting and found out you could boost with a matured Axeman's Folly in order to cut down the tree. I hate skilling. Yet another example of being able to not use the cannon occurred in, of course, once again, the Biohazard Quest and Underground Pass Quest, 
where now Jagex decided still that you can't use a cannon on any of these NPCs. It just can't see them at all. It doesn't even work. So I had to use a lot of Emerald Bolt E specs and Poison Dagger and Recoil methods in order to kill these NPCs. As well, this was also the case in Shadow of the Storm because, well, setting up a cannon down here just doesn't work. And therefore, I had to poison this boss as well and flinch him behind a torch to avoid most damage at these low stats. So when completing Shadow of the Storm, you actually have to take required EXP and a combat stat of your choice. And because I was talking earlier about having low ranged XP throughout this entire quest line, well, I went ahead and used that EXP on ranged so it wouldn't affect my combat in any other way. Now I even had to do one small favor for the small amount of quest points it gave because well, I pretty much had to do every quest I could. And therefore I had to take on the dwarves down inside the dwarven mining area where I couldn't set up a cannon yet again. So there I would just have to poison and recoil these NPCs. But one NPC I could cannon later on in the same one small favor quest was that of the Slagolith. And so I used a safe spot from the initial spawn of the Slagolith to cannon this NPC. And whatever weapon you're wearing whenever you actually hit the Slagolith doesn't matter, as long as your pickaxe is equipped, the very tick the damage hits this NPC. And that includes even a cannon. Now another NPC I couldn't cannon though was that of the fire demon from the Temple of Ikov quest where you actually had to use ice arrows or recoils in order to kill this NPC. And remember this NPC because I will come back to it at a later time in the video. And there were even some instances of NPCs that I wouldn't have to kill at all where you would normally read in the quest guide that these NPCs did have to be killed to continue on to the next portion of the quest. So later in the same Temple of Ikov quest, you could see a great example of this by me skipping over the entire kill of the Knight of Armadil in order to pick up the Staff of Armadil. And this was done by taking the Knight of Armadil to its very border of its aggression zone and putting it outside of the wall to where you couldn't be in its line of sight. This is because the staff has an NPC check, and since you are now not in the line of sight of that NPC, well, you didn't even have to kill it at all. Another great example of this could be seen in the Shield of Erev quest with a Black Arm Gang member. Traditionally speaking, a Black Arm Gang member has to kill the guy in the supply room in order to get the Phoenix Crossbow. But fortunately, if you just telegrab this Phoenix Crossbow on the Phoenix account, or just buy it from the GE and then go to the supply room and trade it over while still in the supply room, well, you don't actually have to kill that guard at all on the Black Arm account. So speaking of Shield of Arav, you know how I said earlier I was going to be going about most of these quests solo? Well unfortunately, I can't do that with the next quest heroes, so I'm actually going to have to go to the clan chat and see who is available to help me with this portion of the quest. Doctor. Chest bra. So Chespra has done as part of the quest where he lures this NPC in here and all he has to do is basically pick up the key that I get from the drop of the NPC. So I'm going to go ahead and hit on this NPC, get some HP EXP but only a little bit to poison him and finish off the kill. And come to find out, I wasted some HP EXP on my limited build this first kill because well, Chespra decided to go take a piss after he lured the garden and therefore just let the key despawn off of the ground. So now I would have to kill this NPC yet again and get more HP EXP and hope to god that Chespra would actually be at his computer. But don't worry, at least he got 5 candlesticks. We interrupt this program to bring you... That's right, today is the very first day that this channel has a merch store. And because I believe in giving you all something physical in return for your monetary support of this channel, well, my merchandise is going to be my main focus, being that I don't even have a Patreon or Join button here on this channel. 
And hell, who knows, maybe with all of your support, next year I can make it to RuneFest and watch that award ceremony rather than sitting at home like I am this year. <laughs> So back on the quest grind, I also had to go about some more difficult quests such as Monkey Madness, Desert Treasure, and Regicide. Now Monkey Madness and Regicide were both quite a breeze since I've done them so many times on low levels, but Desert Treasure was a different story. First though, for Monkey Madness, the hardest part of this quest was likely just going to Smith the Monkey Speak Amulet, where I would wait 10 minutes upstairs for the Gorilla Diagro, and then fake log on the trap door to avoid the stall downstairs, where zombie monkeys can aggress you and you can't eat. As well, I had to deal with the demon at the end of the quest, and I did this once again by running to the downstairs trapdoor on the initial demon spawn while taking his magic attack, and from here I would go back up, find the demon despawned, and then safely set up my cannon. From here I would take eat yet another magic hit, safe spot the demon, allow the gnomes to take his HP down while interfacing my cannon's fire for the very last hit. Now for Desert Treasure, I initially expected this to be a breeze, but well since I am solo in the quest, some of the bosses were a little bit more difficult. Decius was probably the easiest, and you can attack him from this spot and he won't teleport to you, therefore not hitting you with his overpowered melee attack. And I could literally just out-eat his range attacks with purple sweets. Fareed, the smoke diamond boss, was also relatively easy, but did require a few attempts and being able to kill him with only the 30 cannonballs loaded into the cannon was quite hard from a safe range behind the gate. Now the ice diamond boss Camille himself wasn't hard at all, but well, getting there was, especially since I am doing this solo. For the trolls, you can stand close to the gate to avoid the snow effect from lowering your stats such as your range and cannon them down, but the trolls weren't the problem. I didn't know these fucking wolves could hit 16s, and well, with my HP being in the 20s, and this being a multi-combat zone, and there being about 20 of these things, well, they shredded my defense, and I couldn't even pick back up my loot without dying yet again. Fucking wolves. So right here, I pretty much lost the rest of my cash to purple sweets in this ice area. Finally, after three times though, I made it past them, and I killed Camille, but then I realized I didn't have enough food to make it to the frozen ice trolls since the snow in this area damages you, so I took a risk to get my old loot in the pit of wolves for more food. Fucking wolves. And yeah, the risk didn't pay off at all. So from here, I finally made it through the wolves after dying yet another two times and then made my way to the ice trolls. Well, I made it to the ice trolls, but forgot to bring restores, and I didn't think ice cubes had such a high defense level. Fucking ice. I literally could not break them after 30 minutes, so... Time to go through the wolves another three more times, but this time with restores. <laughs> so after finally getting that ice diamond, I had to get the smoke diamond from Demis. The main problem I noticed with this boss was that every time I just entered into his area, he would randomly just spawn and stall my character, then bash me out with his other NPCs around, usually just in one tick and one hitting my entire HP. Yeah, and this happened about 10 more times. Finally though, I got a break and was able to take aggro from a bat and Emerald Bolt E poison him behind this NPC several times with his massive HP between his two forms. After the pain of these bosses, I finally got DT done and barely even made it through the pyramid with enough food. So I needed every quest point I could get as described earlier in the video, and therefore I did observatory quests for a possible two quest points. But after doing the entire quest, 
I found out I got the one constellation that I literally can't do. The one that gives me 900 hit points experience and the skill I would be closest in to leveling and therefore leveling up my combat decimal. Fucking Leo. So while doing Ikrithan's little helper later in the quest grind, I ran into a little bit of a problem. The scarabs popped up on my way to the final boss, and well, they poisoned me, and I really didn't want to be poisoned for this boss fight. So how did I cure that poison with no anti-poison? Well, I just died. So when actually doing the boss for this quest, I did find out that I can set up each piece of the cannon without moving by interfacing between the pieces. And just like at the first episode of this series, I still found the graphical glitch working at the end of this quest, and it is one of my favorites. Also when doing Twibuono Trio, I found a cutscene which actually has almost no tab locks for your inventory, prayer, magic, etc and I was able to manipulate this for the force teleport scene earlier, as well as some hilarious graphical glitches. Now dumb enough, from death to Dorgashin quest, if you accidentally somehow pick up a crate, the exact tick a duck moves next to you into that spot, well, it will swim inside of an empty crate. So I'm not even sure how I did this next one, but I'm sure it'll be useful for a lot of skillers. It's either resulted from me dying three times in the cutscene up until this point, or actually just killing too many of these ice fiends in the cage before attempting to leave. But either way, I was able to leave the cage without actually getting the 40 attack XP you normally roll whenever doing Cold War Quest. Therefore, a skiller could negate 40 attack XP off their account if their account is already ruined or they wanted to stay low EXP. Zero attack XP, baby. Little known fact as well, but if you somehow manage to smuggle out the full effects of the penguin suit, you are actually fully immune to NPCs which are normally aggressive to you. Similar to the cannon placement shown earlier in the tourist trap quest, you can actually set up a cannon during Shades of Morton when you're not really technically allowed to. So, typically speaking, you cannot set up a cannon in the area of Morton, but if you do go south of that area, across the bridge, you can lure shades over and place your cannon down just fine. In my adventures, I even attempted to smuggle out the Xanic crate by combining some very odd quests and tile placement while using the dragon token, but unfortunately this did not even work. Traveling back into the contact dungeon from our second episode, I found that Jagex actually did attempt to patch the NPCs not spawning in this specific spot whenever attacking the Scarab. And when I say attempt to patch, well, now the NPCs spawn, but they don't even attack me for some reason. In the Gatweed portion of Edgar's Ruse quest, it turns out if you get hit by one of the trolls in the supply room, well, they won't kick you out as long as you interface because they'll think you're in a totally different room even though your screen might go black and, well, you can't really move. This is one of the most obscure minor glitches I've ever came across, but I've never seen an NPC like this. For Edgar, you can use any item you ever own to get into a chat dialogue with him, meaning you don't even have to right-click talk to this NPC. Hi. While doing the forgettable tale of a drunken dwarf, I thought I was about to come across one of the first login force teleports I was to find on my own. 
This was because I found out there was an unregistered leave inside of this quest in one of the instances, being the second minecart instance, if you were to just simply die inside of this instance. So by dying and having an invalid leave, I was able to smuggle out some of the cogs from inside of this quest instance, even though they had no real use. But the real thing I was hoping for was logging out would redirect me back to the front of the instance where I entered it from. And unfortunately, this didn't work as planned, even though it did give me a login interface and some chat dialogue directing to the fact that I actually did leave the instance invalidly. Probably the most OP find though was by not myself, but Chessbra. He found a way to diagonal two tick fish lava eels inside of the hero's quest. This meant he could get upwards of 500 mil EXP per hour. And I even almost forgot to mention one tick haircutting. So here's the final question. Would I be able to skip the Darrow training before doing Monkey Madness subquest of RFD this late in the game? Like I said earlier, if I was able to pull this off, I would be 45 combat instead of 52 and save myself 7 whole combat levels. That's because this quest reward is by far the most when it comes to combat EXP. Now, there have been 3 different ways in the past that accounts have gotten past this check and remained lower stats, but none of these were done on the lowest combat level accounts. The first was done by basically having Jagex reset accounts manually after they messed up the combat update. People who didn't have their accounts affected would put in false forum posts and get their stats reset, still resulting in bypassing Darrow training. And yes, this has happened to many people I know, and Jagex didn't properly look into the accounts. Surprised? Unfortunately though, this forum is long closed and the update is long past, so this is obviously out of the question. But these next two methods are where I spent around an additional 80 hours of testing and attempts to bypass this check. So the second method I have actually used myself by manipulating a scrying pool in a POH with stackable interface walking. This was fixed by Jagex around the time period of my Mortania video many months ago as it required the same mechanic. I actually still have pieces of Apatol memorabilia on my defense pier rending which will probably now get removed after this video, but oh well. This scry method was more specifically fixed by placing your scrying invisible character now inside objects instead of on flat surfaces within the scry. Meaning, I would need a noclip glitch that could be used remotely somehow while in the scry to move me through these objects I would now be on top of with my character. Well, I had one idea. With the help of my friend Sam, I was able to manipulate a known way to smuggle off a pugil from the stand in a player-owned house. The reason we did this was to attempt to use the actual effects of the item itself. This is because we found out that this item has force movement no clip properties. When hitting your opponent with this smuggled free walkable weapon, it will move them one square to the right side of the character with the pugil, even through walls, but only once your agility hits zero on the account being hit. Although, was it possible to get this effect into the scrying orb itself? Well, I first figured it might just work if your character has been hit once by the pugil, putting you into that weird state. So we had the idea to try and get full carols to drop the agility to zero from remote scry areas in PvP worlds, but we found out carols only lowers agility relative to your current level, being a 20% decrease. So this meant we could only drop the agility down to level 4, and we tested this further with disease, and it turns out the pugil itself has to be the item to lower your character's agility to zero. From here though, we attempted hitting the account while then scrying, but we quickly realized there is no tick clearance between the damage and the pugil effect, even when stalling, before you get into that scry. <music> Lastly, with some further testing, we realized none of this would even matter anyways, because the pugil itself is an area-based effect relative to where the character who wields it is located. We would literally need to have an account with the fully smuggled pugil outside in the real world, not in a POH. So I formulated yet another way to smuggle out the Pugil's attack styles and animation to further attempt to smuggle the entire wielded item. This was done first, figuring out a new way to get multiple accounts to smuggle the Pugil off of the balance beam since the original method could only work with the owner changing house rotation in building mode. Next, once this was figured out, 
I realized that knocking someone off of the beam would smuggle the animation on the knocked character, even after the POH leave. So I use this effect to first scry which ghost bags and returns all wielded items back whenever unscrying, to then get the Pugil combat styles to show on my character, and from there I got knocked by my other account and left with the portal. So now I had both the Pugil animation and the Pugil attack style smuggled outside of the portal, but I needed the entire item. This is where I attempted to ride magic carpets, minecarts, and even use last man standing. I attempted to do these because these actions and minigames all returned wielded items back onto your character whenever you were through with them. So if the Pugil was just unpainted, perhaps it could return painted and in full effect to my character outside of the POH by these means. Unfortunately though, it didn't work. So, no clipping through a scry I deemed was impossible, and therefore... Now the third way people have gotten Darrow training bypassed, historically speaking, was something I didn't even know until I realized myself it might just be possible. When looking at the prior quests such as Regicide and Demon Slayer, I realized you could stall quest EXP rewards. So I asked myself, what happens if you do this when the server updates? Well, if you all remember Hacker Boy, I asked him for some advice, and come to find out, they had the same idea weeks prior, and well, it worked. The Darrow EXP reward goes into a stall before granting it to you. If you were able to go into this stall last month as the servers updated, well, it wouldn't know where to log you out, and instead it would revert your account profile back to the save 15 minutes prior before every update. But quests and checklists have a hard stick to the character, where EXP rewards don't. This meant you could do a quest and get the EXP reward, and even if you got rolled back 15 minutes, your quest would stay there, but your EXP wouldn't, and it would allow you to make some very nice accounts. Unfortunately though, and mistakenly, Jagex seemed to have fixed this issue when coincidentally fixing the world hop waiting durations. And now, a system update will roll through all stalls and fake logs on the account, and put you exactly where you were whenever you were logging out. Prior in the video while testing a bunch of quests, I stumbled across a 2 minute anti-log, meaning no matter where I was in the game, I couldn't log out no matter what. So maybe I did have one last trick up my sleeve, and I would have to put all my bets on this one thing. So basically I'm going to attempt to do the same thing, but instead of using a short stall or fake log, I'm going to see if I can use this 2 minute anti-log to my favor whenever the server rolls through an update, and therefore, I'm putting all my bets on this one and waiting till Thursday. So unfortunately, the account did get the EXP, and even though everything was set up 100% properly, it was my last straw. So it's good to know, even though I spent 80 hours just for a failure, that I learned all that I did, and I believe that this 52.425 combat will still be the lowest ever possible now with Barrow's gloves. And to be honest, I was extremely disappointed after all of this effort. But let's just go ahead and finish this quest off and kill the boss. So red click actions have some very weird properties, and they will actually stop an NPC in its tracks that you last attack as long as you keep spam clicking a red click action at least once every game tick. So what am I going to do to kill this boss at such a low level? Well, I'm going to click.
Yo, wait a second. There's literally a cannon right next to me. And like a real man, I will complete this quest in Varrock, not Lumbridge. And guess what skill I'm going to use my antique lamp on? Well, none of them because it's bankable. Okay, well everyone needs to fashionscape their accomplishments and based on the comments section, I've decided to do just that. But unfortunately, this weapon is just a little bit underwhelming for being a 175 quest point requirement. So, do you all remember that boss I told you to remember earlier in the video? Well, we're gonna go back there. So I had an idea earlier when testing the cannon on this NPC. What I'm gonna do is have another account at that same point in the quest Temple of Ikov, as shown earlier. On AQP Bra, I'm going to set up a cannon in a very specific spot. Then on the partially quested account, attempt to block off this NPC in a select area. Now I recently had a tweet asking me how a certain someone got an anger weapon into Verox Square, but that's when I abruptly explained to him, well that's why he's in Verox Square, because he can't actually move with this weapon. So you can interface on a teleport to keep an anger weapon on, but from there, you're stuck. But guess what? With my cannon constantly trying to attack that fire demon, I now have a stackable interface walk. So now I can take my cool new sword, along with my newly acquired gloves, and bank stand like a pro at the GE. So what is the moral of today's story? Despite having all these failures, I still can be the lowest combat, and look like a badass. Thank you all for once again watching the new episode of Lower the Better. By the way, I'm still changing my name at 1 million subs, and I'm about to start a real life series this next week to help me do just that. Also, for real, check out the merch store in the description below. If I get some positive feedback on this store, more designs will definitely follow. And also, I am so sorry for this episode taking as long as it did, but let's just say I got sucked into an endless loophole of things to test when going down this quest list. Lastly, the Golden Gnome Ceremony is tomorrow, guys. And I'm excited and worried at the same time, because who knows, I might even have to get that chest broad tattoo. But anyways, I hope you all have a wonderful day, and I'll see you next time on, well, in real life content.